came. In other words, you're putting back in the earth what belongs there. Even if um, the energy mix that you recommend can be uh, pursued and can be developed, you say there's still a profound problem. And the profound problem is that there are too many people living on planet Earth. Would you say that you actually welcome the idea that over the next hundred years the world's population by one means or another will be cut dramatically? I'm afraid so. I think like, the word likely I would use is... But, but my question was, do you welcome it? Oh no, of course I don't welcome it. Because we currently have a population, what, of about six and a half, getting on for six and a half billion people on the planet. A bit more than that already. I think it's about 6.8. Is it? Yeah. Well, and I know the projections are that it's going to go up to nine billion by the sort of halfway point in the 21st century. I've... So uh, what do you think is, is a viable figure that, that Gaia, that the planet, can sustain? I would guess, living the way we do, uh, not more than one billion, probably less. It's largely a matter you, you of how you You say that with live. equanimity, but that, that's, that's uh, postulating the most dramatic and terrible and unimaginable sort of cull of the human species. Well, I'm stick by it. I think it will happen. I think it's very probable. How, how, what time frame? It'll take almost a miracle to stop it happening. This century. This century? Mm. Uh, I, I'm trying to get my head around that possibility. It seems to me if that's to be the case, such is going to be the level of, of misery and, and uh, panic across the world that there are bound to be the most cataclysmic conflicts, wars, struggles, simply for survival. Well, again, the, uh, whenever events like that come along, fam when, when there's huge floods, famines, there's, there's a certain amount of struggling, but there's an awful, also an awful lot of good comes from it. When confronted like that, ordinary people show e extraordinary heroism and helpfulness towards others, as well as being looters and, and vandals and so on. It, it, it's just a, a thoroughly disturbing thing, and it will happen. I just wonder, you know, because it, it, you have a very, very uh, high reputation for creative thinking. And here you sit saying, we are facing doom. We are facing the possibility of, of five-sixths of our human population being wiped out within a century. Do you bring any ideas to the table as to what we should be doing now to prevent that? Because you say you don't welcome it. We can't prevent it, but we can try to adapt to it and prepare ourselves to live in a much diminished world. And that is where all of our energies shall now be going. And the more time we waste on things like wasteful, silly ideas like renewable energy, uh, the, the, the worse things will be in the end. So what do you mean by learning to live in a diminished world? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, obviously for Britain, already well, immigrants are coming in from the hotter parts of the world. We've got to prepare a proper place for them to come to. Uh, we can't just let them go into ghastly camps, bidonvilles, or into the ghettos in cities. We've got to, to handle this as a political problem properly but, and but prepare you, for it. You see, isn't there a contradiction here? Because you're, you're very concerned about overpopulation, and you believe demographics are a huge problem, and yet you're saying that, that a country like Britain should be preparing to take a whole lot more people, new, immigrants, uh, surely, in essence, if you're respecting Gaia and you're respecting the notion of sustainability, uh, you have to say, I'm sorry, but this particular patch of our planet can't take more people. You're absolutely right, Stephen, and that's one of the agonizing problems that's going to face us in the not-too-distant future. I see it's a bit like a lifeboat, and there comes a point when the, the, the crew of the lifeboat have to say, look, we can't take any more. If we take any more, we'll sink. And quite literally, we will sink in the sense that we won't have enough food to feed the people that come in. And that point, I don't think, has yet been reached. And I'm talking about now, uh, when I say we've got to prepare. And that alone is enough to do. What you are preparing to do is something even more dramatic. You're preparing to make uh, a mission into space.
Oh, that's sheer pleasure. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's, let's that's talk about lovely. it. I mean, you're, first of all, you're, 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 forgive me for saying you're 90 years old. Yeah. And you have signed up with Richard Branson uh, to be a passenger on one of his first, if it ever happens, and he says it will, one of his first civilian space flights. With a gift from Richard. Uh, it was an upgrade. <laughs> I didn't sign <laughs> up. One, he one heck of an upgrade. How many, how many miles did you have to have for that? 60 miles. <laughs> but let, let's be serious about it, because I just wonder what's motivating you. You say you want, before you die, to get that view of the whole planet from space. I'd love to. Why? Know. Well, you see, f uh, a long time ago, in 1965, I was working at the Jet Propulsion Labs, which was one of NASA's facilities in America, very soon after NASA had started, and on the problem of life on other planets and things. And that set me thinking about this planet and led me to Gaia, th Gaia thinking uh, that it's a remarkable and self-regulating planet. And it was the view from space through instruments that helped me come to that conclusion. And uh, I was also deeply impressed by those iconic images the astronauts sent back of the Earth as seen from space, particularly that one from the Moon. And just to have a bit of a chance to see that in my lifetime. It's wonderful. You wouldn't miss a thing like that, would you? Well, I, I haven't got enough air miles, but, but even if I had, <laughs> I, 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 I'm seeking, a, a, suppose, a, 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 to dig a bit deeper into your motivation. Do you believe that humanity has proven itself unable to live in harmony with planet Earth and that therefore humanity's future has to lie beyond Earth in, in colonizing other mm -hmm. places in our mm -hmm. universe? Most definitely I don't. I think it's obscene even to think about it. Really? We have a beautiful planet which may be unique. But you say we unique. have despoiled it and damaged it to a point Not where we, most of our population is going to die. No, things that evolve always muck up their place. The fo first photosynthesizers appeared on Earth long, long, long ago. Wrecked the place with oxygen, which in their time was a deadly poisonous gas. But everybody's adapted to it and they now use it to drive their cars. I mean, it, it, harm can be turned to benefit. And you see, we are the first really intelligent animal that the planet's ever had. We can think and do things. And there may be one day, far in the future, when we can actually help Gaia. And all new, newly evolved organisms on this planet usually make, make mistakes of some kind or another. And uh, the mistakes can be good uh, uh, or they can be very bad but rectified uh, as it was with oxygen. Or, and I hope that the mistake we've, we, mistakes we've made will be rectified in time and ho hopefully by us ourselves. I think you're the first man I've ever met who could qualify as both a believer in the most terrible scenarios, most of humanity dying off, and still qualify as an optimist. Is that possible? To it be both? is. It is. Yes, because it's a hell of a future. You see, I'm lucky. I, I was a, a student at the beginning of World War II, and believe it or not, in 1939, most people were scared stiff, more than they are now, about the consequence of something nasty happening. That We thought that London would be completely wiped out by bombing. We thought of it as kind of Guernica writ large. Uh, but of course it wasn't true, but that's how they thought. But when the war started, they found there were enormous numbers of things they could do. Life suddenly grew much more interesting than it had beforehand. And this is true, of course, only of the young. Uh, but this, I think, will happen in, in the troubles up ahead. It'll be hell for old people and for mi the middle age, but the young will find an immense, immense opportunities in it. Going to Greenland, for example. James Lovelock, we have to leave it there. Thanks so much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you, Stephen. It's been great fun. Well, I've enjoyed it very much indeed.